companies, countries are are thinking. You know, and it helps develop my perspectives. Absolutely. That. So yeah, that's, that's one recommendation with with regard to a blog, but um, I'll, I'll think of some other ones to go along. A, a, a very unique position that you have, to some extent, created for yourself to sort of have your finger on the pulse beat of uh, international politics and world events, and, and that must be a very gratifying position to be in to, to have access to these people who can give you these varied perspectives. Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes I wish that I was the State Department, uh, you know, had a, a, a phone line to me where they could ask my opinion, but I, I think they want the people with the official degrees and the ones who've contributed a lot of money to the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Uh, that, that's how our State Department works and has worked for a, a long time. Um, I don't know. Uh, they seem to cultivate the people who have got the international uh, studies or international degree relationships in multiple languages. I, I only speak Spanish and badly at that. Um, but I've got lots of miles on the ground. I've got lots of boots on the ground, as you say. Mm-hmm. And I've been mm-hmm. to a lot of places. And, you know, God, I would love to be pulled in or drawn in as a consultant, but that, that's not the way things work. They want, they want to make sure you've got party loyalty and, and various other things. Um, it's it's not always the truth that they're after. They're, they're not always after veracity. Uh, more often than not, they're after predictability. They're after how, how can we bring this situation into a predictable circumstance? How can, how can we make this fit our political desires. Uh, it's a control kind of thing. It's a manipulative so we, kind of power. We run into, you know, periodic cyclic problems with countries because you have one party that it fits and then another party in power four years later, eight years later that it doesn't fit. And you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and you don't you don't particularly have uh people there going, here's our interest and here's their interest. And somewhere in between, we can work it out where we don't have to have these cycles. We don't have to have these rebellions. We don't have to have these these uh, breakouts. And then, you know, somebody also with the guts um, to call it early, somebody with the guts like Winston Churchill to just say, this Nazism has got to be beaten down now, early and often. Well, we need mm-hmm. somebody with the guts to say that now with... Uh, Islamic uh, extremism, and I don't I don't see that happening. Sadly enough, Lawrence, could you give us a timeline for your next trip? I, I know Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia are on the uh, the itinerary. Tell us a little about the the upcoming trip. First, first of all, I don't know the the t- timing of it, Rich, because uh, it takes about thirty five thousand forty thousand dollars. I I can generally do when I'm loosely budgeting um about $750 per country and then perhaps you know the airfare uh, on top of that but um I've been to every continent including Antarctica except for Australia so Australia will definitely be in the next go round and my plan is to get to the uh World War II battle sites where the US essentially island hopped and pushed the Japanese back toward their mainland island, mm-hmm. um, the the home islands, and yeah. uh, places like, uh, you know, Iwo Jima, Tarawa, Guadalcanal, well, there's mm-hmm. about 15 of them. Yeah. I think about somewhere between 12 and 15 of them that have become independent island nations at the, the UN now, which is in, in line with my quest to get every official UN member nation. Then there's the um, nations that surround them. So, for example, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, uh, Philippines, uh, Borneo, Mm -hmm. New Guinea, uh, the Sultanate of Brunei, um, Singapore, uh, Australia, of course, New Zealand, and French Polynesia. And the interesting part about that, I think it'll take about six months, 
And the interesting part about that trip will be it will be much more difficult logistically than any of the previous epic trips that I've taken. And that's because the, the joke is on some of those places you can't get there from here. Uh, uh-huh. Meaning you can be right next, one island can be right next to another island, but because of political affiliation or racial differences or just the airlines or ship, shipping companies that are serving those particular islands, they may not be affiliated. So uh-huh. you're not going to go from island to island. There's just not enough people uh, wanting to make that trip to make it worthwhile. So what you've got to do is go backwards, or you've got to mm-hmm. go virtually beyond that island. You've got to fly beyond 2,000, 3,000 miles and then come back. Yeah. And so it, it makes the planning really difficult. You've got to schedule all of those islands and find out, okay, what are the days or the only days that airliners come in? Easter Island is, Easter island is an example. You know, it's isolated, yeah. completely out in the middle of the, the Pacific, most isolated uh, populated landmass in the, in the planet, and you can only get there on Sundays and Wednesdays, for example. Tell and us a little you about your, your visit to Easter Island. I'd be very curious about that. Say that, say that again, please. Uh, tell us a little about your visit to Easter Island. I bet that was an experience. Tell us a little about it. That was absolutely incredible. That, that was four years ago when I went to Antarctica, every country in South America, and Easter Island. And Easter Island, along with... Uh, Machu Picchu was one of the highlights, and probably Easter Island more so because it's such a mystery. Machu Picchu, uh-huh. not not that much of a mystery. Um, they can do some archaeological work there that they can figure out more or less what happened. But Machu or Easter Island, you you just don't know. There's so many theories, and you know, are they the poster child for ecological disaster? That's the modern theory. Uh-huh. Too many people using their scarce resources for a single obsessive desire to create these statues to the point where they cut down all the trees or burned all the trees on the island and virtually at the end didn't have enough wood to even build boats to get off the island when they were down to about 100 in population. And so did they then become cannibals or not? I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. But that's one theory. Another guy comes in with a theory and says, no, 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 the rats came in and ate up all the trees and there there was no cutting them down and they didn't use the trees for rollers to get the statues from their carving place down to the sea. And you just there, there's no certainty because the, the whole thing on Easter Island was about oral tradition. It wasn't, they didn't leave any written tradition. Or if they did, it's nothing that anybody can interpret yet. And a good portion, the, the women were not allowed to be educated. Only the, the men could be in a position of being, uh, quote-unquote, in the know, the records that they kept. And most of those men were captured in slave ships and sent to the mines in Peru. And when they finally returned, there was only 15 of them or so who survived. That. Mm-hmm. And they came back, and so they really lost all of their history. And so, you know, what do these statues represent? We know them as ancestor worship. But beyond that, uh, how exactly did they get carved? Well, we we think we know. We don't know exactly. We don't know how long it took. We don't know how long they got these statues liberated from the rock. And you can can see some of them that are still what they call in situ, in sight, partially carved out from the volcanic rock. Uh You don't know how they got them then, and raise them up because some of them were the size of, and weight of locomotives. You don't know how they raised them up and got them miles down to the sea. Mm-hmm. There's just so many mysteries about Easter Island, and, it, and it's maddening in some ways, and it, it's curiosity evoking in other ways, and it makes you want to stay there and read every single book and to dig a couple of these things up yourself. You're probably familiar then with Thor Heyerdahl's Aku Aku, which uh, explores theories yeah. about Easter Island, yes. Yes. His are some of the, the earlier theories, the theories that have gone way beyond that now, uh, mm-hmm. beyond Heyerdahl. Heyerdahl is, is one of the the older set of theories of what happened there. But the sad thing is there's just really no existing oral history um, that will explain what happened. Wow. 
an unsolved mystery of, of the of the distant past. You were in Antarctica during the winter, I understand. Uh yeah, it was it was winter up here in the northern hemisphere, but down there it would have been just the opposite. It would have been, uh-huh. in essence, their summer months. So it was ideal. I went in January of 2011, uh-huh. and uh, it was an incredible place. I don't know that I would particularly want to go back unless I went to one of the big bases like McCurdo or Scott Base or something like that. But I went uh-huh. to the peninsula and island hopped, and... Um, saw more penguins than I ever want to see again in my life. And the little buggers are interesting, but they stink to high heaven. And after you've had a couple of days worth of them, you just don't, don't really want to see any more penguins. As, as cute as they are, you just have your fill of them in pretty short order. Uh, one, of the, one of the highlights was uh, joining the Polar Bear Club. And I went uh, about as close as you can go to skinny dipping on, on Deception Island. It was zero degree water. And there was about seven of us that went in on a ship of 98. I was on a Russian icebreaker. And there was about seven of us that went in the water. And I want to tell you, it's not something that you wander in too slowly. You just run as fast as you can and do a big belly flop and you get out there. And it is so shocking. And you're in that water and in about 20 seconds, Rich, you can't feel your feet and you can't feel your legs. It felt like 10,000 toothpicks sticking into my legs. And then my feet could not feel the bottom, and I started to stumble. But uh, amazingly, my upper body felt like I was on a beach in the Caribbean. Wow. No dichotomy between the two. But I spent, uh, I'm going to say, about three minutes in, in the water, and then uh, came came out. And I just because I had to, I was I was starting to get where I could not navigate. I could not walk along the the gravelly bottom. I was so numb. In our remaining minutes, uh, we have a few minutes left. Tell, tell me a little about uh, Chichen Itza, and tell me a little about the shift to, to New Earth, to 5D, which Gwendolyn Rhodes will be talking about uh, on December 26th, oh. which show, yes. Gwendolyn Rose, when you talk to her, I think on the 26th, will be a much better source uh, talking about 5D. I, I really don't know about that all that much there's there's so many different directions that you can follow with regard to spirituality mm-hmm. and mine tends to really be toward reincarnation because i believe that there is actually scientific evidence there for reincarnation as uh evidenced by dr michael newton mm-hmm. his book, mm-hmm. including journey of souls destiny of souls and his concept of life between lives where we um don't just go within a matter of seconds from one life to the next, but that we spend a significant amount of time in between lives, planning our next life, meeting with our bit players, you know, our soul group, those people who are going to be our parents and our brothers and the sisters and our teachers and our, our significant others in the next life. So she can speak much better to 5D um, than I can. But I can say that the experience on December 21st, 2012, Yes. Chichen Itza was a pretty incredible experience. There's people from all over the globe there at the pyramids. Yes. And uh, a lot of them were dressed up in their Mayan costumes. A lot of them were dressed in all white. Uh, there was quite a bit of kumbaya, uh, in other words, you know, hand-holding, circling, chanting, uh, praying, singing. Uh, that was a delightful experience. I got in on a press pass and so was more of an observer than a participant um, in that regard. And because of that, I, I for about four days in there, I just got no, no sleep. I was going everywhere I could to every, every outing, every party. Well, I would imagine that. So, that I could, so I could write about it, and I could, I could say there, there's a festival crowd that goes throughout the planet. Well, and, and I would imagine follow, that. The energy level was absolutely electric when you get that many people from so many different places that are all there with one mindset. That that was the beautiful part of it, is the fact that it was all positive. Mm-hmm. There was, there was, it wasn't political. There was nothing negative there. There was, there was no differences of opinion. Uh, people might have had different theories on you know the Mayan calendar and uh-huh. is there an end of time 
is this is things really going to collapse you know tonight after midnight there's very few people who are there thought that they really looked at it as more of a shift a kind of a of a paradigm shift in in people's spirituality and i can say for however evidence is accumulated for that sort of thing i believe such a thing is taking place you can, you can see it with people people are getting away from the old time religion people are getting away from dogma people are getting away for my way uh or you die and go to hell um you know that that's just not realistic anymore because if it were virtually everybody on the planet would have to be dead because they're going, they're violating somebody else's religious credo Every every religion, it seems like, if you don't agree with me, you're going to die and go to hell. So, you know, the Muslims say that, and the Christians say that, and the Hindus and the Buddhists and everybody says that. They're excluding virtually everybody else, and they themselves are excluded by the others. So, right. luckily, we're we're getting away from that. And Fortunately, we are yeah. getting into a period of much more acceptance. Um, we see that in a in a generalized acceptance, for example, of the you know gay, lesbian, uh, bisexual, transgender lifestyle that would have been unimaginable 20 years ago, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. for example, and kind of realizing that we are all souls, we all have soul energy, and in the way I look at it, Rich, is we are here to learn to grow to evolve, to fix our karma, and a huge, huge aspect of it is to help other people along on their journey also. And that's it. It doesn't get a lot more complicated than that. I think that pretty accurately sums it up. Um, Before we close out the show, I would like to invite you uh, to uh, something I'm planning up for the spring, an author's hour, a show that's going to invite published writers who have been daily talk guests in the past, people who've been on my show before, to come together for a panel discussion. I hope you'll return, along with Becky Butchko, Winlon Rose, Lori Reagan, Linda Beauvais, uh, and all of us, of course, will be discussing tips on uh, writing and on publishing. And By then, you, your book, next book will be out. Can you tell us a little about the, the title and, and when it's going to be coming out, the next one? Well, the next one is, is actually out of order. It, it's Book two, and it does have to deal with all of Central America, Mexico, and uh, Cuba. While well, Cuba is still illegal, I, I kind of like that forbidden fruit aspect of going into Cuba. That was fun. Oh yeah, we can do that on another show. I would love to cover that, as well as Buenos Aires and uh, Mardi Gras in Brazil. There's lots of different yeah. areas to cover. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll do that, Rich, gladly, and I will be glad to be a, a part of that program. Absolutely. Well, Lawrence, I want to thank you very much for being my guest tonight, and I want to wish everyone listening and calling in a great evening, and good night. Thank you to Terry for calling in. Absolutely. I'll I'll be there for the Authors Summit. Ciao. Uh, Yeah.